All right, guys, so we're back with Adam today. So, Adam, there's been uh, yes, sir. a lot of guys have been uh, really liking the last two videos about Xing Yi. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. So, uh, more questions about it. Mm -hmm. uh, one specific one is can you combine Xing Yi with other arts like uh, white eyebrow or baji? Yeah. Can, you, can oh. they complement each other? Kind of? Yeah, they can be complimented in any way, but personally, I, I don't like to look at it like that. For me, anyways, right? Like mm -hmm. you look at this art and you go, "Oh, it has this ca characteristic. It's really cool." Hey, check out this art. It's, it's got these characteristics. It's really cool. Maybe I can use this art and, and you know, combining with the other art to kind of substitute its weakness. So it's becoming very intellectual, like a game plan, right? Personally, I don't like doing that because every time that has been done, if you look at it from a long term, usually it leads to kind of like a jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. So I. I like the more Taoist way, which is more natural and organic. It's kind of like um, an example would be, you're doing a movement, right? You're playing your stuff, but you start training, you start training, you start training. You start getting pretty good at it. So by that, I mean you get functional speed, functional power, functional accuracy, distance control, all that stuff, Tao down. And then once you're at that part of your journey, naturally, or your teacher should tell you, hey, it's time to test this stuff. You got the stuff now. I'll say, okay, you start testing this stuff. And if you do it enough, you're going to go through the journey of getting beat up and not getting beat up and whatever. Eventually, if your learning curve is pretty cool, you're going to get, you're going to experience some success, right? When that time comes, for most normal people, like normal human beings, you're going to have stuff coming out of you that obeys the principle, but are not things you have trained before. Like, um, I talk about it way back about catching a ball. It's not about techniques. It's like, hey, I never trained this, but it just came out. When that time comes, now is a good time to integrate an art. Because you didn't integrate the art. The art's integrating itself now. Now it's organic. For example, uh, there's a story of uh, Grandmaster Wong Chung Lung where he got into a fight and he needed a guy in the face. And a lot of his seeing that he was criticizing him afterwards. He won the fight, right? They're like, that's not Wing Chun. In all the Wing Chun forms on Hong Kong Wing Chun, there's no knee in the face. And Wing Chun was like, well, in Wing Chun, when you do the most direct thing, that's his principle. The closest weapon to the nearest target. At that moment, his head was closest to my knee. It's Wing Chun. So that's an example of how something came out that is not Wing Chun technique, but it's Wing Chun concept, and that's good enough. So if you, now you cut that. Now let's say you get another person that experiences the exact same phenomenon. He's not supposed to name the guy in the face, but he named the guy in the face. Knock the guy out. It's not the technique, but it's a concept. Okay. At that moment, he can just go cool and then walk away. Or if it's more organic and natural, he can start saying, huh, knee in the face. Interesting. How many angles could I do that? And then when he starts playing with it, if he's aware, he will start to notice after he starts playing with it. There's different ways to also not just do the angles of kneeing, different ways to set it up, different ways to use it as a finisher, different ways how it blends with different energetics. You can tense up your leg and use it as a weapon and knee a guy, or you can turn off your leg and just use the hinge. When that happens, your leg starts to dangle. When that happens, now after you knee, you can kick. That opens the door to sticky leg techniques. So now you're opening different category of movement. And if you do that, you will plateau, obviously, because you're human. And then you start getting real proud of yourself. You're like, hey, look how organically you grew with all these brand new skill sets that I've never trained before. I invented it. But then you get, if you're smart or if you're humble, same, then you'll look around and go, everything that is coming out of my body that's organic exists before I was born. I didn't know this system already does it. Oh, look, that system already does this. That's when you start looking at those other systems, and then it gets. A lot of time when I'm filming with you, Chris, people are like, hey, Adam, uh, what technique is this? And I used to get in trouble because uh, I didn't name the systems properly. So now I go out of my way to do this when I remember. Oh, this is from Xing Yi, this is from Each One, this is from Wing Chun, this is from Long Face. And I do that, right? Haka Face, whatever. But I didn't set out to integrate these things because I'm not a smart guy. It came out organically. And I go, oh, this, st this stuff is kind of like that. I start playing with it, right? And after I finished playing with it, when I was young, like in my 20s, I thought I was smart. And I go, oh, look, I just invented something. And then, <laughs> then I realized, no, I'm really dumb, actually, because these things that I'm doing actually exist long before I was born. So why don't I go study it? And then when you study it, then you realize, wow, whatever new idea you got, usually somebody already invented the entire system around it. Now it's organic. So that kind of... Integration is organic. It's not you sitting there using your intellect going, oh, that's long range, oh, that's middle range, oh, that's trapping range. 
I need to cover all distance. I'm going to combine this art with this. It's all projections in your head. And that leads to a jack of all trade, master of none. Maybe not for everybody, but for me, my approach, I try to stay more out. Um, I try to stay more Taoist. And I think this idea is really important for daily life because we're kind of challenging ourselves. The age we live in is kind of like, okay, how much information can I stuff into my brain before I break down? I think that's what everyone is doing every day. And that's very complex. It's not organic anymore, right? And you wonder why people are going nuts, right? Or, or high stress. So this Kung Fu idea, this Taoist idea is very important to me, that new things should happen organically, not you chasing and, and, and constantly looking for something new, constantly try to integrate things with your mind. That can drive him, like, you know, if you live like that, that can, that can really drive a person crazy, right? So, yeah. it so doesn't you have to get effect. good at something before looking to change it. <laughs> but like... even that is natural. Even that's Taoist. If you set up to get good at something, that's a lot of, a lot of stress. It's only because you have a passion for it. That's natural. So you, so you naturally get good at it. But if you're like, no, I hate training. You know, it's funny. I'm always talking, type, type, type. But I never train. I love my short though. Well, no. There's some, something going on here that you're not admitting. Maybe you don't love martial art, and that's okay. What's wrong with that? But if you love it, then naturally you train. But if you have to motivate yourself and you have to punch yourself in the face and psych yourself up to train, do something else. And a lot of people do that outside of martial art. They're constantly beating themselves up, right? Not good. If you get good at martial art because you love it, it doesn't make you special. It's kind of like one time I was moving on somebody and things turn out pretty good, right? And they're like, wow, you're amazing. I'm like, no, I'm not amazing. How much you train a week? He's like, five hours. Like, I train 40. Not, I didn't beat you because I'm amazing. It's almost, it's not even fair. Not, you're just not better at it, yeah. Yeah, but I'm better at it, but not because I'm better at it. You, you'd be just as good if you train just as much. It's about time and passion, right? right? But that's natural. You can't force yourself, right? So it's the same thing with integration. If things integrate itself, great. If you're making it and contriving it, Usually it goes off the rails pretty quick. Yeah. So if you uh, if you go through the process and integrate something, yeah. like you gave the example of the knee. Yeah. But I, I didn't integrate anything. It's natural. Right. So it comes out somehow, and you're like, oh, cool, cool. Yeah. So at that moment, you you could say, I wonder what else I could do, and that's when you could go out and search other systems. And you can do that. You can right? just just you can constantly look at stuff, right? And constantly look at stuff and go, hey, maybe I can examine that. Yeah, you can do that. But I mean, don't contrive it too much. Because whatever come out of your body... Should come through training. It, no. Your, your training, I set you up to test it. But when you're actually testing it live, a bunch of stuff will come out that you never trained before. Uh, okay. If it doesn't, then your testing is not really that harsh. It's still too confined. I don't really like talking about this because I'm worried people are actually going to do this and hurt themselves, right? <laughs> But when things come out of your body that you never trained before, that's real. That's not you sitting there reading something, Googling something. And it's not mental masturbation. It's not intellectual. It's like, no, it's coming out of your body, your nervous system, right? Because everyone's unique. Our bodies are unique. Our mentality is unique. Do you. Don't do somebody else. So when you copy somebody for the sake of copying somebody, you're really reinforcing good. inferiority complex. But if you're copying somebody, based on what came out of your body, now you're using other people to help you. That's what a teacher and a student is. You see the difference? You're learning from somebody to help you. You're not learning from someone to try to be like to them. be like them, right. right? And this, I know this is cliche and everyone knows this, but even though everyone knows this, you don't see people doing it much, right? And that kind of leads to the next thing that you told me that you were asking about sitting practices, like different type of sitting practice. It's the same thing. This, there's roughly about 600 systems of sitting practices Jeez. in China alone, right? But it all boils down to two methods only, doing and not doing. Not doing is Taoist Wu Wei, but Taoists also get corrupted and has doing practices. Doing would be a, an example of a Loi Dan, internal alchemy, or a, another example is like an Indian Kudalini. You're actually doing something with your stuff, right? That was the doing practices. Not doing practices would be like, um, that was Zhou Wong, or well, actually, yeah, Zhou Wong means to sit and forget. More popular the Japanese version, Zen or Sazen. This would be non-doing practices. You're not doing anything. You're just setting up, but it's like gardening. 
It, you're setting up the condition for something to happen. So you are doing something, you're setting the condition, but then you leave it after that. And that is different, right? I could be wrong, but because I'm biased, because I'm a Taoist, but a Taoist want to be. <laughs> but from my experimentation in the last 30 years, especially the last two years, not doing practices, most definitely um, is better for people's mental development in terms of uh, happiness, um, love and connection, right? And also inner peace. So that's why in clinical trials, always proven to reduce anxiety, stress, depression, and all that. So non-doing practices is better for that. From a Taoist point of view, doing practices is a supportive practice for that. Because some people can't do non-doing practices. They have mm -hmm. to start off with the non-doing. And a good explanation of that is Tibet Buddhism. They have a lot of doing practices, like Tantra. But they say the highest teaching is Dozen, which is non-doing practice. So the highest is not doing. So, but they give you all this Tantra stuff for 20 years. Because they're like, most people can't do this part. So do this part. Kind of like in a Chinese hermit. There's a lot of Zen monks, but a lot of them also practice chanting. And then I remember one monk was saying, well, well why are you doing that? The, the interviewer, right? He's like, why don't you just go into that? Why do you got to do all this chanting practice? He goes, well, most people can't do this. So you give them this, and then maybe someday they can do this. But sometimes you meet people that can just do this. That's awesome. But if you ask most meditators, they'll all tell you, yeah, I can do this. But that's just words, right? So not doing basically means just that, just sit there and don't do anything. No, it's way more than that. It's kind of like when you're gardening, you get to set the soil, then make sure there's sunlight, right. make sure there's water, right? Well, sitting is the same. It's not just, I'm just going to sit there. Eventually, that that's true. But there's a bunch of stuff you got to do, right? So maybe on another episode, if you like, I can talk about that. Or I can refer you to other teachers, right? Mm -hmm. But meditation is like pretty serious stuff. You can really screw yourself up if you don't do it, right? So I don't really advocate people just downloading an app or Wikipedia and start practicing. I know that's common nowadays. And there's a lot of new age meditation masters. If you can, try to find an actual good teacher. It's just safer, is what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Any other questions for this week? No, that's it for today. All right, man. See you next week. All right. Oh, I forgot to announce. Um, is, there, is the camera still going? Um, on the 21st and 23rd, we have a live YouTube and Facebook uh, lessons for Wing Chun. Yep. And I'll, knowing me, I'll probably sidetrack into a bunch of stuff that's not Wing Chun. Also, by July, the Salim Tal book that I'm writing will come out. And uh, also the third level of the Wing Chun, which is the BG form and all its application. The both Hong Kong and non-Hong Kong version will be available on my website. If you're interested in that, you can join the full immersion program on adamchenkungfu.com. Okay, guys, see you next week.